Great. Well, we're um, about to embark on our second webinar with Phil Straw. And um, we've, um, I've just had a look and we've got quite a few people coming on, logging on. So we'll probably just wait a little, a uh, few more minutes and uh, get the get the rest of uh, the people, uh, the latecomers coming in. So um, you've got a couple of minutes, go get a pen and paper and, um, and a glass of water or a cup of tea and we'll be with you very shortly. If anyone wants to put any early questions that you've got in the chat, um, we're, we're going to monitor the questions and also the chat, but um, I'm happy for you to put some early questions or any sort of, um, I guess, ideas for future webinars as well would be really valuable for me um, to get a bit of an idea where people's interests lie. Uh, so uh, just 5.02, so Phil, we might just wait till maybe four yeah. past and then uh, we'll get started. Okay. Uh, anyone who's in, um, who's actually logged on now, if you missed out on the first webinar, which we had on Monday the 15th of May, and that was on the East Asian Australasian Flyway, um, that presentation is now up on YouTube. So if you uh, go onto YouTube and look up the uh, Local Land Services New South Wales channel, it'll be one of the more recent postings that, that have been put up there. Uh, so that one was um, really successful. That went really well. It was really interesting. I learnt loads. And I think everyone else did too. So um, yeah, so we'll just wait a little bit longer. We've gone down one person. Someone's left already. I must be more engaging. <laughs> okay. Just wait one more minute and then we'll we'll get stuck in. <laughs> okay, well, I suppose we could get started, Phil, really. Um, okay. May as well. Um, well, yeah, we've got a lot. Um, as I said, we had a, another webinar on the 15th, um, East Asian Australasian Flyway. So um, anyone who uh, didn't catch me before, you can look it up on the Local Land Services New South Wales YouTube channel and um, it's been loaded up onto there if uh, you missed out on it. Uh, that was a really great one, uh, really interesting. And uh, we're going to sort of go into a bit of a different area, uh, looking at, um, at Tower Point and some of the challenges in managing um, a Ramsar site and the different agencies involved and how that can sometimes um, be a little difficult to handle. Um, other times it's great because you've, you've got all this varied um, experience uh, that you can uh, tune into and get ideas from. Um, but uh, I'll just introduce myself. So uh, my name's Liz Bully. I'm a Senior Land Services Officer for Greater Sydney Local Land Services. And um, as, I, as I said, we've got an excellent speaker today, uh, Phil Straw, and um, he's going to be talking uh, to us on saving Tower Point Ramsar site and a uh, spotlight on the Eastern Curlew, Little Turn and Pied Oyster Catcher. So uh, they're really iconic birds that in all the, in different ways use tower for, um, at all different times of the year, uh, sometimes for roosting, sometimes for breeding, sometimes for feeding. And, um, and they're all uh, amazing iconic birds of Tower Point. So, uh, we'll be uh, covering that today, but also just going into many of the management issues with Tower Point as well. Uh, I will begin today uh, by acknowledging the tr traditional custodians of the land in which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so if anyone wants to put uh, what uh, whereabouts they are uh, logging in from today, that'd be really great as well on, on the chat, because personally, I like to see where everybody's coming in from. It's often local people, but you know, this, it's such an interesting topic. There, there could be people, logging in from all over Australia for all we know. So that'd be really interesting for me at least. Uh, so yeah, um, second Can webinar, uh, format today, uh, that we'll be uh, giving a brief introduction of uh, Phil's background. And then uh, Phil will share his screen and he'll present on uh, saving Tower Point Ramsar site. 
at the end, we'll have five to 10 minutes of questions uh, and uh, that'll be followed by a short survey. Uh, I know sometimes people don't like to fill a survey. I've made it really, really simple. And my main thing that I'm really interested in is to understand what you want from local land services in terms of topics to be covered in the future. Uh, so what's currently happening is we've, we're reaching the end of our five year um, project with um, federal, federal funding under the uh, National Land Care Program, which is now going to be National Heritage Trust. And uh, we're applying for another five years. So this is the perfect time to tell me maybe what we've got wrong or what, where you'd like uh, some of the topics to be covered, uh, to be focused. So if you could uh, fill that out in the short answers, that'd be great. Okay, so a little bit of a history. I'll, I'll, I, had to, I had to cull down a biography that Phil gave me because he's got such a um, interesting background. I had to make it as short as possible, so I'll quickly run through. Uh, so Phil's involvement with wetland management and the study of migratory birds, uh, that started in 1960 when he worked under Dr. Luke Hoffman, who is pretty much considered the father of the Ramsar Convention on wetlands. And that was in the Camargue in the south of France. He was involved in the MAR conference in 1962, which called for an international convention on wetlands, uh, following concern that, um, that with the rapidity with which large areas of wetlands in Europe uh, were being impacted. So this led to the birth of Ramsar. Phil left France to work at the Edward Gray Institute of Field Ornithology in Oxford. And then he soon traveled to Australia where he worked for the Department of Zoology at Queensland University for five years. Then the research department of New South Wales Fisheries followed by the New South Wales Parks and Wildlife Service. So he's had a very varied uh, background, uh, lots, of, lots of interesting places to work there. Uh, in 1992, he formed his own company. So he's worked in the design, construction and management of wetlands with that company in both Australia and also in Asia. In 1996, he convened a symposium which led to the launch of the East Asian Australasian Shorebird Reserve Network and subsequently eight countries recognising 19 wetland sites that were critical to survival of these migratory species. Phil is the Australasian Water Studies Group's East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership Liaison Officer, that's a mouthful, and is now working with the CEPA Working Group of the EAAFP. So without any further delay, I'd like to welcome Phil to this webinar and hope that you uh, take away many learnings from this event. So thank you. Uh, and I'll be helping Phil. I've got the presentation in front of me, so I'll uh, share my screen and uh, we'll get started. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen, Phil? Yeah. <laughs> okay, yes, I'll, turn my, I'll turn my video off. Okay then. Okay. Right. Um, so, uh, Okay, well, we can go on to the next slide. All right, um, thanks. <laughs> well, this is uh, the image of um, the uh, Ramsar site and also um, the, um, uh, reserve, the aquatic reserve, which is um, all important. And uh, this is the location. And um, just give you a, a, a large view of that. Um, in Botany Bay, so perhaps we can go on from the next one, Liz. Okay, um, this is a part of a report I did for the uh, local land services uh, some time ago, and it's showing all the uh, roost sites in Botany Bay at that time in 1984, um, which is uh, somewhat different from now. The, um, the Terra Spit. Um, uh, image uh, which you can see there. There's um, now this change as an island, and lots of other things have happened in the meantime. So there have been a lot of changes. So we've we found that. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Uh, this. Yeah, and that's um, as the situation now. The um, we uh, actually I'll go on. Uh, uh, this is Botany Bay at the uh, at the moment, it doesn't show up the, uh, the, the the lesser number of uh, sites there, but um, I wasn't able to update this before. So we'll uh, just go on because I've got some interesting pictures to uh, to follow through. So the next one. Now this is um, the um, elephant's trunk, as it was called at that stage. It was. Um, um, where the uh, the most important roosting site for. Um, like the shorebirds, it was a nesting site for little terns, and um, 
and this was in 1984, just uh, at the time when it was going to be uh, listed as a, a Ramsar site, just coincidentally. And um, um, we tried to get this uh, this part stabilised as it broke off. You see what happens next when it go along. Uh, and um, we got a, a, a contract from Federal Airports Corporation to uh, to do this, um, but um, the EIS for this, which is put, went through the uh, ports, uh, so the Maritime Services Board, uh, uh, was unsuccessful, and we we weren't able to um, do a compromise on that. So that that failed in that respect. But uh, anyway, we'll see what's happening next. So next slide is um, this was predicted to happen that terrace the terrace spit was going to break away as an island. And that was uh, reported by the Australian Literal Society in 1973 in a report to the Commonwealth Government. Um, so we tried to st uh, stop it from doing that. And it's, uh, as predicted, it's moving in a westerly direction. It's been moving at 20 metres a year. And uh, this is in 2001. You can see how far it's moved from where it was, the red writing there, which is still the elephant's trunk or terrace pit. And you can see Carter Shoals to the left down there. And that's where. We predicted it was going to go. I, I thought it would either go on and merge with the, the Carter Shores, or it would disintegrate, or it would continue on towards the, the mouth of the Cooks River. Uh, the next one shows us uh, the next progress from that. And you see it's already moved, as, as we predicted. It's now headed down to Carter Shoals, which is just um, below the island now. It's a long, skinny thing now with a bit of vegetation in the middle of the sort of a boomerang shape. So it's been a huge change over that time and it's merging with um, um, Carter Shoals and becoming elongate. But um, we're fortunate that uh, that um, it's moved that far and but you'll see by the next slide where it's actually, that's where it is now, five years later, and it's still part of the Carter Shoals. The islands are still attracting um, uh, quite a few migratory shorebirds and everything else, but um, we've got to look at to see how we can stabilize that without compromising the whole thing, because uh, it's all to do with uh, hydraulics and everything else, but it's been stuck there for five years and it's, um, it's still working, and that's our major site. Um, okay, just go on to the next one. And um, we did look at it before at all those. Uh, so there's three sites, uh, there's three species that were um, part of this uh, project. And these were three sites where, um, as you'll see later on, was uh, presented as part of the um, the uh, uh, Ramsar. Um, uh, uh, notification of the, um, the, the, the the concerns in Botany Bay and um, the, the Pied Oyster Catcher, the Eastern Curlew, and the Little Term were two, three species that were listed particularly at that stage. Uh, just going to the next one. Pied Oyster Catchers, as you see from the graphs as go along, has actually um, been, it's been quite incredible. It's not all that many pairs that nest in Botany Bay, but this was a, a study, another study I was involved with, uh, which compares with the Hunter Estuary, which is HG, and the blue um, lines at the background. And the Pied Oyster Catcher has actually been increasing. You see, in 2002, there's um, less than 40 birds on the, on the, um, in, in, in the, at Terra Point. And um, you can see this is now going up. And it's fluctuated around 100 or 100 plus now since this one 2016 we have uh, at least 100 and perhaps sometimes a bit more in the bay so we can't really explain that because uh, it can't be, we don't think it's just from the recruitment from the the birds that are nesting in um, in um, in botany bay so whether we've got recruitment from elsewhere or not but anyway it's a good a good outcome because it's one of the main species that we wanted to um, improve the uh, situation for them as part of the um, the offsets for the um, the concern of the, the loss of uh, birds in Botany Bay. And the next one is, uh, uh, and you see, uh, this is right up to date. 
uh, how they fluctuate um, over the time for different years. But if the average out, it, um, we have gone over to over the 100 mark now, and that's what we, we've still got. So uh, in 1972, I think it was one pier in Botany Bay, and uh, we've come a long way since that. So we can't explain all of that, but it's uh, at least been successful. There's probably a lot to do with the fox baiting done by Parks and Wildlife Service to protect their uh, eggs and such like and young. So um, so that's, that's a good news story from, from that particular species point of view. And the next one uh, is, uh, is the Eastern Curlew. Eastern Curlew is globally now listed as critically endangered. And it was one of a species of, of particular concern. We were very concerned about what was going to happen in, in, in Botany Bay at Tower Point, uh, Ramsar site in particular. Um, okay, from the next one on from that, I think we've got some charts on this one. And this is um, also, if you look at the red line, which is Botany Bay, um, the population, as you'll see later on, was about 250 birds in the bay, and over the years it's declined, but it's, it's settled down at, again at 100, um, uh, 100 birds, and that's been like that for now for uh, for um, 20, 20 odd years. So it's still a good thing, and provided we can retain that roosting island, which I pointed out, we've got a fair bit of work to do there, but I'll explain that, but there's, there's uh, some issues there. That's again, um, comparing with the Hunter Estuary, which is the most important site for motor shorebirds in New South Wales. So we're doing well there because they're, but they're losing uh, because of various changes in the morphology and everything else of the Hunter Estuary. But um, that's another species that uh, we've been able to hold. And the, the left um, graph there gives you a, a clearer view of a pretty constant <coughs> line of accounts. Uh, Next one, and that's just again just a, a simple event right up to, to give us right up to the date, two twenty three. But um, we haven't got the last count there for there. But uh, you'll see that the um, and the, the dips in between, of course, is when the birds are not here. They migrate, as you would have seen on the last presentation. They fly up to the Arctic, and are there for. Um, uh, for four months of the year and the for six or seven months of the year they're with us because they um, they're here for, for their, their, their non-breeding season which is very short it's only about four months in the Arctic with about uh, six or seven months with us so that's still a pretty good outcome for what's 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 happened so far and we've just got to try to maintain this but I'll we'll go into that a bit later so the next slide list now, little tern uh, is somewhat different. We uh, that's a nesting bird. It breeds. It comes down from, from the Japan and other parts of the. Um, it doesn't go right up like the. Um, a lot of us are sure birds go up to the high Arctic. This one uh, is um, lower down. And uh, some actually a sub another population actually breeds where these birds come from, <laughs> and they come down here as non-breeding birds. So we get a bit of a mixture, but. but Bit uh, together to, and in the same flock sometimes, and it's a bit confusing to many people. But um, we've had a um, a problem where the, the, the where the island originated from Tower Spit, uh, Tower, the elephant's trunk at Tower Spit, rather. Sorry, um, but that's um, changed, and we've got a fair bit of disturbance there. We've got a very small nesting area, and in the last couple of years or so, they've not been nesting on. Spit Island, they, they were doing that, but because of the shape and change of the shape and the size of it, there's their areas uh, reduced. So we're not getting uh, particularly large numbers of little terns. So that's one species of concern that we can still work on. I've got some proposals, which you'll see a bit later on in this presentation about um, uh, providing um, um, somewhere for them to, uh, to, to, to nest as well. So we'll go on. And that's just, um, you see some very big peaks. And when they first arrive, if they're going to be successful, if they, the bigger the, 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 uh, the um, 
the flocks that come in to, to nest, the better chance they have, because the more birds there are to protect them from predators, uh, such as silver gulls and ravens, such, such, such like there's enough birds to drive away those predators. So if you have enough space for them to breed and they're smaller colonies, well then they are more susceptible for to uh, to uh, predation by av mainly avian predators, um, predators rather than terrestri terrestrial um, uh, predators such as the uh, Pyroesticator would be more susceptible to foxes and such like. Um, so um, as I've just gone over what the text was there over there. So the next one on this. Okay, this is just uh, the situation in uh, 1993 as far as uh, national and internationally significant populations of motor shorebirds in Botany Bay. In 93, we had uh, 250 um, um, the Eastern Curlew, which, uh, as you know, now is reduced right down to 100, but compared with other areas, uh, we're still doing reasonably well, even though we've, and that's the the international um, um, of importance, the sites of importance is 210. So at that stage, we were above, above that. And uh, as you can see, 2023 is down to 100 and plus. Pacific Golden Plover is a bit of a sad story for Botany Bay. Um, Compared with the hunter, we uh, we've got uh, zero in the bay itself, but we do get some of the place for Boat Harbour, which is a rock platform outside the Botany Bay. But we can't count that as part of the Ramsar site because that's a different little bit population, even though very close. Lesser sandpiper, lesser sandpipers, uh, a threatened species, and um, uh, initially there was a, a couple of hundred in the bay. Uh, that was of national importance and. Um, a bit below the international importance, and uh, but we haven't had a um, less sample of a, at all in Botany Bay or, or Boat Harbour uh, in recent years. A ruddy turnstone was down listed. Some of these birds were actually they they did include Boat Harbour in the counts for uh, for Botany Bay, which is a bit um, disjointed, a bit uh, difficult. But uh, we've got one siding in. Um, in Botany Bay, but we've got probably about 20 of them at Boat Harbour, which is just outside. Same with the Golden Plover. We've got about, about 20 odd birds that go to Boat Harbour on the rock platform, but not coming into the bay. Okay, next slide. Okay, now this is back in uh, 2012 uh, when um, the results of all our monitoring, we've been monitoring now for um, since the uh, the Bramsar site was um, listed, and um, we found that going on the data that we've collected over that time, um, they they examined these um, the the trends and found that the the number of birds declined so low from the time it was listed. It's um, what we call um, uh, past its limits of acceptable change for, uh, for the re original um, values of the Ramsar site in 1984. So this was brought up at the Ramsar COP, and um, they had um, that stage that the World Wetland Network coincidentally happened to award some uh, wetland global awards. A blue globe is uh, one of a pristine site and uh, looking very well. And a grey globe, which is one of concern. Tara Point was awarded the grey globe because of the declines of that time from our data. And um, then uh, we had to uh, look at that situation again. And you'll go, I'll talk about it later on. There had to be a, the, the, the Australian government had to come up with a, uh, ask the New South Wales government to come with a response strategy what they're going to do about these declines. And um, that's, uh, I will explain that a bit later on, but it's not a lot of good news from that point of view. Um, so as I say, the limits of acceptable changes you see there uh, was exceeded. And um, um, so, and the New South Wales government had to come up with a uh, response strategy, which I'll come through a bit later on. Um, so it's basically on uh, count data, 
And uh, also, um, as far as the Ramsar site was concerned, one of the biggest concerns was an increase in, man in mangroves by 35%, 34%, but a big decrease in salt marsh. This is quite significant because salt marsh is very important habitat for the golden plovers, which have basically disappeared, and some of the other birds that used to use that for roosting, and the uh, sharp tailed sun bobbers actually used to use it for, for feeding as well. So, those were some other of the uh, things that have changed as uh, part of those changes in the uh, in the management or of the of the bay or not sort of man management sorry the the, the effect of uh, uh, all of the um dredging and such like which we probably talked about earlier in the, in the previous presentation causing changes in hydrology and everything else and erosion uh, and um, wave action on the southern part of the botany bay next slide Okay, this is uh, one thing that I did in Botany Bay as a side. This was a, a sand quarry uh, on the southeast part of Botany Bay called, uh, called that on, on, um, unimaginatively as H1 site, which is now called the Willoware Shorebird Lagoon, which you'll see in a moment why it's called that. But that's the, uh, I was asked to look for an offset site for the RTA the, at the time for an impact they had on another wetland, and um, I selected this site, uh, much bigger than the uh, one that's been uh, impacted on, and uh, uh, to do something with that to create habitat. So the next one shows uh, this is the, um, the, the the plan. So from from just a, a, a plain lake, 10 meters deep, with a couple of islands on it. We've actually create on the top side there some intertidal mudflats, which you'll see a better picture of it later on. And the bottom right hand side is uh, where, because this was a freshwater deep, uh, deep uh, lake, two meters deep, and we connected it to a channel on the southeast, uh, uh, the bottom right hand corner of the bay, uh, of the uh, lagoon, sorry, to allow uh, seawater to come in and change it to a brackish situation with tidal changes to make it. Um, um, the, the, the the mud flats there uh, exposed and on the low tide and covered at high tide as they would do in a much bigger uh, bottom bay situation. So um, I think that's uh, uh, one of the things that you'll see some images later on about the impact of tall vegetation. And um, on the north side there we. A lot of uh, tall casuarina trees was actually built by the the the, um, the people doing the um, the uh, uh, um, quarrying of sand and that. And um, but yeah, you'll see that situation uh, has changed somewhat, but uh, even for the worst. Uh, but uh, anyway, we've got that um, uh, right on the shore itself. It's free from tall vegetation, uh, but we've. Uh, during the process of this process of here, we actually removed um, a lot of the mangroves, uh, uh, the sorry, casuarinas, which is very tall on the shore. We actually removed quite a few of those in the process of um, creating this habitat, as you see at the moment. And also, uh, mangroves started growing there because once we let the seawater in, mangrove seedlings um, came in through the weir. And started growing everywhere because when it was fresh, it's just reeds around the outside, and they died when they saw what was allowed. So that created, killed them and created some mud flats. But um, we, um, there was a plan of management for this. Actually, this time I was the uh, under the uh, Department of Planning, so we were able to do this. And um, there was lots of other things we could do there, but. Once it, uh, we got to this stage, the Department of the Planning decided to, uh, they didn't want to retain the land anymore, and it was um, uh, included into the, um, the Tower Point Nature Reserve, and therefore the Ramsar site. Anyway, we'll go on um, the next slide. Um, here's the we have that I put in to hopefully keep out most of the mangrove seedlings coming in from the left, from the, the to the uh, channel into the uh, lagoon which is on the or the lake which is on the right um, 
this is remodeling, uh, although it's sort of falling in disrepair now because it hasn't been managed because of lack of resources, but uh, that was part of the design as well. So um, uh, we'll go on beyond that because what's um, happening if you don't um, uh, keep the mangrove seedlings out, you don't have to manage a different way. So this is now a deep, the deep water lake, to me is deep. We um, uh, got some machines in there and laser levelers on bulldozers and we pushed uh, some of the, um, for the sand from around the shores, uh, supplemented from other fill material available from council that uh, had surplus um, um, uh, material from other uh, dredge operations and we put all that in there. This is the start of that. Then the next one just goes on to the finishing touches. And you see, we've got a pretty large intertidal mudflat. And um, as you'll see, this is sort of created on along the lines of some other work I've done overseas in creating similar sorts of wetlands. And, um, and particularly for motor shorebirds and such like. There's not many of these sort of sites uh, in Australia, if any, and there are not so many in the flyway either way. So anyway, this has um, uh, been successfully used in a couple of other countries where I've worked to create intertidal mud flats and the islands you saw are still there, you can't see them behind the machines, as roost sites. So this is to uh, add some extra habitat to the area to try to make up loss for lost habitat within the bay. Um, next slide. So this is just afterwards. You see his micro shore beds there, and of course the old uh, white um, ibis who always gets a look in as well. So it succeeded in this uh, objective of uh, offsetting the um, the wetland that was being impacted by the um, the um, RTA. So um, uh, everyone was happy with that situation. But then, as I say, once it was handed across to the Parks and Wildlife Service, unfortunately, the, uh, the funding at the time uh, was not sufficient to follow the plan of management. And that's still a thing we're working on with the local land services who helped to um, do the funding for some of this work now, not the, uh, the machines and that, but to, to maintain what we had created, that last picture before, uh, where you see that uh, extended mud flats. Next one. This is what I was talking about. Mighty shorebirds do not like tall vegetation. And this is uh, done for some work from many years ago by Wayne Lawler in uh, looking at the lots of estuaries in New South Wales and worked out this is the distance that they like to be away from tall vegetation. The reason for this, they like to have a clear view around them to see uh, potential aerial predators. If they're not, they feel uncomfortable and leave the site. And little terns, uh, when they're nesting, have the same situation. They don't like they like to have little bits of vegetation to stabilize the around it for the, around their nest. The little chicks can go and hide in that, but um, they won't use sites once they become overgrown with mangroves or other um, tall vegetation. Next slide. Okay, now this is the one I showed you before on the left, and this is today's image from um, aerial mapping. And you'll see a much fuzzier effect on the North Shore, which is where all the vegetation is now encroached across onto the, the shorelines, uh, including uh, tall um, casuarinas. And um, and this one is, is mangroves as well. So there's um, a whole lot of area there, which has since been cleared. And that's going to be cleared on a regular basis there. But um, and that's, uh, we've lost a lot of the open aspect uh, for migrant shorebirds, so the numbers of birds have really dropped off at that site. And we're currently working on that process now. This this year, we, we're now between the, the birds away at, um, on, on the breeding ground. So this is the time to get in there and do some work so we're not disturbing the birds. So there's quite a lot of work to do. And this is where we're at this stage. Uh, next. So a lot of the work you've done, you see the top right hand picture there, it's a bit reminiscent of the, <laughs> the machines I had in the, in the, the Willowell Shorebird Lagoon. And um, 
There's a work done in uh, in 1965 where we were doing everything with a wheelbarrow and a shovel. Uh, occasionally, get a little machine in there, but it was uh, all all uh, uh, hard work. And um, an island in that middle bottom right and uh, middle corner, uh, middle image on the right, was creating islands using uh, sugar bags and um, and rocks and gravel and that to keep it clear of vegetation. And the bottom right down is the the famous, uh, now famous, way to scrape in the UK, the place called Minsmere, and it's still a famous site now, and it's, but it's much bigger and much better managed. The bottom left is the sluice gates were made out of driftwood. And <laughs> um, so it was a pretty uh, tough job. The top left hand corner is also another picture of the, of the way to scrape. Next one. In fact, we use that, um, um, uh, design in Maipo in um, in uh, Korea uh, in in um, uh, Hong Kong, and that's been a very successful site as well. It's, it's another very famous site, but we're using similar technology. We've uh, increased, uh, improved a, a lot of the habitat there as well. So I've got some proposals here is to extend the boundaries of the Ramsar site to include existing aquatic reserve, which as you saw right at the very beginning, where we had the picture of the aquatic reserves and the, um, the nature reserve together. Um, one, uh, one important reason for that is that the island you saw actually moved uh, through that movement outside of the, the boundary of the nature reserve. So uh, we're, re we're pretty keen to retain it. Now it's stopped moving. And can work on it so it's still retained part of the Ramsar site but the best thing is to include aquatic reserve which is um, the values of the aquatic reserve meet the same requirement for Ramsars for wise use of wetlands and um, they're protected from any commercial fishing and everything else so that would help a lot if we can get that uh, boundary of the uh, Ramsar site so you've got the you've got the nature reserve and the Ramsar site as it is and the aquatic reserve that would help immensely. Um, and the other one's still working on the Woolaway Shore, Shorebird Lagoon. Uh, we need to uh, remove the damaged weir and the shot weir and uh, do that, remove the vegetation that's invaded um, over the original um, lagoon and treat the surface of two islands to create suitable sort of little turns. And they have to be really, they like to use sand with uh, very little on it, some shell grit, but they don't like to be closed in. So that can be done relatively easily, but um, with some additional funding, because all this costs a lot of money. The uh, the monitoring we do is um, fairly inexpensive, but when you come to this sort of work, um, and at the moment, as I say, they're clearing the, the, the tidal flats again from mangroves, which we're allowed to grow um, through lack of resources right at the beginning after we did the, um, it was uh, annexed into the nature reserve. So all these sort of things um, uh, have been put in place for management plan for ongoing habitat management. Next. Okay. Now, some of the biggest problems we've had is actually um, getting um, uh, a better communication and cooperation cooperation between different government agencies. I don't know if many of you have, have heard about the Marine Estate Management Authority. It came up in 2016, where they say for coastal wetland pr protection, and all of these agencies are really part of that. We need to need to work a lot more closely there. When we first had the response strategy, we did have a workshop um, where um, a lot of um, government agencies were brought together and we came up with the, the response strategy was a joint effort between quite a few so we need to work back into that so really we want to work very hard now to get all of these agencies together um, over this next couple of years or so um, because everyone's interested in the same sort of habitat we don't want to sort of uh, compete with fisheries over habitat because it's the same sort of habitat we want to protect for little birds uh, for shorebirds and others as well so that's where we're sort of at, basically. Um, I think it, we might have another slide there. Um, yeah. So um, um, so the data, the data collected the, for, uh, for the uh, Tower Point Ramsar site was critical in its um, 
finishing up with a response strategy by the New South Wales government, and that was finalised in 2019. Um, so, um, and from that, they found that the resources uh, for the scale of appropriate management, key drivers of the change uh, operating at a scale well outside of the control of the site manager. So the site managers have not really um, been able to, they wouldn't be capable to handle things as they've been going. So that's got to be looked at. But unfortunately, um, as you'll probably guess, uh, the environment in, this, in, in New South Wales and Australia generally is not at the top of the um, the budget from, from governments, uh, uh, <laughs> and particularly in New South Wales, the Parks and Wildlife Service. So um, uh, there should be, it was recommended that there should be baseline studies and monitoring to elevate the progress of little turns, continue to monitor total numbers of little turns across the summer season and um, implemented as um, the implementers there was suggested it should be the local land services, which is being at the moment, but we're going to work on that with the, the islands and the lake over this next um, couple of seasons, well, while they're away at the moment. Margaret Shorebirds is going to continue monitoring the diversity and populations of Margaret bird species at key sites and at any new sites, such as the uh, Lagoon and anything else we, we come up with. Uh, again, that's um, um, it was suggested that this should be implemented with partners, including the local land services. A review and reporting the purpose of the response strategy to halt the decline and improve the ecological conditions of the Terrapoint Ramsar site as soon as feasible, so that ev the evidence is uh, available to support the removal of the site from the Article 3.2 of the Ramsar Convention, uh, which is which it was listed as a site of concern, and it's still that there, and the Australian government particularly does not want it struck off the list as a Ramsar site. So um, uh, communications with the, uh, this all started with communication with the, the Greater Sydney Local Land Service back in 2017, uh, which led to the con conclusion that the ongoing monitoring that we've done for so many years and little turns and part of the should continue in the long term to monitor um, uh, uh, the long term mon uh, monitoring program put in place prior to the listing of the um, site of a, of a, um, a wetland of concern. I think that's about it there. Sorry about a bit of a rush. Um, it's quite a few things to cover. So basically, um, the Ramsar site uh, was uh, gazetted, gazetted in 1984 as a site of international importance. And because of changes in the bay and the industry, the airports and ports and everything else around there, a lot of changes in all the sites on the northern side have since disappeared. So it's even more important now on the south side at the Ramsar site uh, that we get it right. And um, we've got a fair bit of work to do. But um, uh, it's a bit of a battle without uh, large resources, but uh, we're getting there, and uh, some of the things that we've got in, in, uh, in line hopefully will retain the birds at the numbers similar to what we've got at the moment. And I think that's it, is Liz? Okay. Just, yeah, there we go. Uh, can you still see my screen or? No, I see you. <laughs> Just see me. Okay, great. Okay, thanks for that, Phil. That was really great. Um, yeah, uh, so I've got some questions actually um, yep. that have come through. We, we we did have a bit of an issue last on the last webinar where um, all the questions came through right when I was logging off. And so I didn't get to answer any some of the questions. So so I do apologise for that. Um, I'm, and it hasn't happened today because I do have questions here, which is which is great. So uh okay um one of the questions i had sent through on my phone was um actually someone was asking about um migratory birds so uh, when the birds migrate do they s stop along the way or is it a direct flight so um I, 
if, if you wanted to go to YouTube and have a look at the previous webinar that we did, that, that would have been covered there pretty extensively. But it, I mean, Phil, if you wanted to answer that now as well, that'd be great. Yeah, that's right. Um, but that was uh, the last one that we did. It was totally following the birds from here to the Arctic breeding grounds, in the breeding grounds, and come back down again. Um, they um, uh, breed up in the Arctic, a lot of uh, birds up in the uh, Alaska and um, Northern Asia. And um, their, their breeding season is fairly short, about only about three or four months of the year because of the resources up there. And then once they've all bred, they fly past across the Pacific to go up on the west side, stopping off in China to um, and Korea to reload um, fuel loads because they have to have leg, eggs and such like when they get there. And then they come back again on one flight across the Pacific, which is a huge flight of up to 13,000 kilometers non stop. They'd have yeah. sore arms up in your wings that length of time, but I won't go any further than that. Just say, as Liz said, look at the previous um, webinar, which you can look and see all the details. Yeah, yeah. And uh, like I said at the time, I think one of the best photos is actually of a bird that had just, uh, of a uh, Bartel Godwit that had just arrived yeah. back. And you can see that the lack of condition, it's so skinny and like, all its rib cage is sticking out. So you can just see they've used everything up. So that's why it's imperative when they get here that they are just left alone to feed and build up their reserves again and not be chased by dogs <laughs> or people. <laughs> right, yes. Yeah. Uh, and another interesting question as well, which is something um, I know that with, with um, you know, the Region Honey Eater program, uh, they're breeding up birds in, you know, at yeah. um, the Ronga Zoo and re-releasing them into um, into Newcastle area. Uh, someone's asked whether or not that that's an option for any of these migratory shorebirds to have a breeding program and maybe be re-released into into certain areas, or is that would that not be a practical option? Uh, it's been uh, used on one species. It's a species called Spoonbill sandpiper, which is critically endangered, and it's a flagship species. And they've done something similar to that, um, but they do it uh, on the breeding grounds. Um, what they do, they get the um, the chicks that have hatched and put them into, um, um, well, they actually take the eggs and uh, incubate a lot of those to increase the productivity on the breeding grounds. They then take part at the normal po uh, population and will join them on migration and everything else. And that's been reasonably successful, but it's a, a huge thing. But other ones, it's... Um, it hasn't been tried with, with other ones, just as in um, some species. Um, there was um, some done in the UK at the Wild Island Wetlands Trust there where they actually um, did um, rear the, the eggs and chicks of Springbills plant cypress there, and I've seen those there. But um, they decided that the best thing is to the head starting, that's to give them a head start from their breeding grounds, and that's a complex situation. So it is possible, and this has been done for that very, very, very rare bird. Okay. Uh, someone else was asking whether local land services is part of council. So I'll I'll just clarify. So uh, Greater Sydney local land services or local land services, but I'm in the Greater Sydney region, is part of state government, and we're actually administering the funding from the federal government to protect threatened and endangered species. So with Ramsar, with um, Tara being a Ramsar site, that's actually part of that program. Uh, so. I, I would be administering funds to council, for instance, um, and national parks and other bodies to actually carry out activities on the ground. So just to clarify. Uh, and I think there was another question on my phone. Um, uh, someone was asking about volunteering opportunities. So that is actually something I've had an email about this week and I really have to look into. So, um, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll take a note and, and, and see if yeah, I can... I'm glad that's come up because um, uh, in the Hunter, there's a, a big volunteer effort to protect salt marshes there. And um, every, because of the change in hydrology there, the, uh, and the tides have uh, brought a, a, a lot of mangroves that started spreading across um, one of the biggest uh, salt marshes in New South Wales. Uh, and uh, the only way to really manage it was um, doing what we need to do at the um, um, Willow uh, Wader Lagoon is to go there, 
uh, after the seeds have started to sprout. So you'll get seeds, a lot of seeds coming in each time the big tides come in, you've got a big drop of uh, seeds. And the best time is to wait for them to get about um, you know, 50 centimeters or, or less high. The reason for that is because you can go along and grab them and pull them out. Yeah. Rather than trying to collect the seeds and everything else. And that's been very successful. They put hundreds of hours a year, and now over there, there is a tens of thousands. So we're going to call on volunteers from the Sydney region, um, the southern New South Wales branch have done some work in uh, Strathfield and there's more wetland there in controlling mangroves on that side. So we want to try the same thing again there and we'll be um, pushing for that um, during a couple of conferences coming up for uh, Bird Life Australia and such like. So yes, volunteers. Yeah, is. I was going to mention Bird Life yeah. Australia is a good one to go to as yeah. well. But well, you can have uh, 10 or 20 volunteers working together and they can clear an area by just going through and pulling stuff out by hand. Otherwise, they start growing up and getting too big and then it's affecting the birds anyway. So um, while it's, it's fairly short at the moment, it's been fairly cleared of, uh, of mangroves, is to uh, get out there. Uh, this time of year, we've got, um, say, four months before the birds come back again. We want to do it before they come back. And that coincides with the the, the um, growing of the seedlings. So yes, we can use some volunteers. Yeah, yeah, the, the, that's kind of what we're doing a little bit. We're doing some work, um, I think you mentioned it, uh, uh, through national parks, uh, all aware pulling some of the mangroves out, but it is that, it's that window. You're just like, I've got to get it done now yeah. before they all get back and <laughs> and you're disturbing them, like you're creating disturbance. Um, exactly. I think I've got a question here. Linda Street wants to know about ongoing monitoring of shorebirds since Council lifted the dog ban in these sensitive areas. That's probably more of a question for Sutherland Shire Council. I'd be approaching them probably about that one. You know, the uh, Marina State, and they haven't done their own um, assessments for that. So they, they, it's just a thing that they need to look at. Um, they've got a lot of, uh, in um, one of the areas where the eastern curlews are roosting, uh, dogs off of lease there have been causing real havoc and that's um, contrary to the uh, Companion Animals Act they should always be under control and um, that's not been policed there sort of uh, to appease the uh, local residents but I think a lot of the local residents would uh, rather see the birds protected rather than letting a few of them uh, uh, dogs uh, run around. One of the big problems with, uh, with, with, as I said on my previous presentation, is that uh, every time the birds are, are disturbed, they take flight and fly around, and that time they're not feeding. Yes. And we see that they're not building up fat reserves for the migration. If they don't have enough fat reserves, they do not migrate. They don't fly along and fall in the ocean. They just get, don't go. They, they do the calculations in their own minds, and um, that means we don't get recruitment and we've got a decline of, uh, of birds anyway. So it's a serious threat and we, uh, some councils have done some really good work over the years. I've been involved in uh, locating some places where dogs can be exercised and some beaches that are not you know, used by shorebirds and such like. So there's a lot of work to be done here and that's why I said on that last slide I had, we need to work together with all agencies over this next mm. uh, this year. Okay, well I think I've, I've covered all of the, um, the questions we had here. Um, yes, there was there were quite a few local people. I saw a few um, postings there, but um, uh, basically, I'd just like to thank everyone for attending, and especially Phil Straw. I think both of these webinars have been great. Um, as I said, we're we're going to be applying for the next lot of funding for the next five years, so it's the perfect time to just in the survey tell me what you want um, LLS to deliver. I guess in terms of webinars, or or if there's other things that you you see. Uh, that need attention uh, to do with Tara. So um, if you can fill out the survey, uh, and basically what will happen as well, uh, you'll get a follow-up email tomorrow, which will also have a link to the webinar. If you missed something or you wanted to see one of Phil's um, slides again, you can re-watch it on there. And then we will eventually be putting that on YouTube as well, I would, I'm assuming. Um, yeah, what I just say Liz, at this particular stage, um, it's been uh, um, extremely useful to have uh, support from the local land service for the last few years, because as you know, I I had my own business before and um, I had my own boat and everything else and uh, do a lot of work, but uh, now uh, we've got another boat from the George's River um, Keeper and uh, 
they are now doing the monthly um, counts. When I first moved up to Newcastle, where I'm now, I was going down every blinking month with my boat and trader yeah. all the way down to do the counts. And then we managed to get them involved. And um, that's been fantastic. And you've been giving them support, which is extremely important. So uh, it's things like yeah. that. Um, so I work on an yeah. international team, but um, I won't go into that. So it's a big, long story, but uh, protecting the birds in the whole flyaway. But uh, that's anyway. That's the challenge, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and uh, for those that are still on, I went on uh, what the shorebird, which was only on a small dinghy, but I went on that on Monday, the shorebird count, and um, and yeah, it, it was, it's so amazing because the last time I went was in November, and so there were quite a quite a lot of eastern curlews. There were little turns um, on the on the spit, particularly on the tower spit. There was so many birds, but. It was really interesting yesterday just having a look and um, there was almost 50 pied oyster catches just on the spit and um, mm. bartail godwits that hadn't migrated and yeah it's a it's a fascinating uh, fascinating thing but um, yes looking through binoculars on choppy waves is not good for the stomach <laughs> <laughs> so I found that a challenge so anyway um, I think we've got one more question actually sorry um, Oh, we're going to get back to them after the webinar, apparently. So um, I think it must be, it's probably a, possibly a volunteering question, something like that. So so I guess okay. I guess we'll just um, just wrap up. And yeah, if anyone, like I said, please fill the survey out. I'd really appreciate it. And it gives me direction on, um, on topics, future topics. And, um, you know, maybe maybe one day I'll, I'll go to Tower and I'll see a white-fronted chat there. That would be a big highlight for me. But... <laughs> Because they're not there anymore, are they? I don't think. No, they've finished. Just um, that was one of the most important places for the white fronted chat that uh, lives in the salt marsh uh, here, and also where salt marsh occurs even uh, away from the coast. They're um, they like that sort of habitat. But any uh, anyone wants to go through you and um, uh, put their name down as volunteers, you can give me all those, and I'll certainly pick up on anybody who's particularly interested. Yes. Yeah. No, I'll put my email in the um in the email that will go out tomorrow. So I'll, I'll put my, well, it goes from the GoTo uh, website, but um, yeah. Okay, well, great. Um, we'll um, uh, we'll leave it there. I, I I now know how to end the webinar. I worked that out from last time. So um, we'll, we'll finish up and, and thanks again, Phil, for your time. It's been really fascinating. Thank you, Liz, for everything. Okay, see you later. Yep.